Okay, everyone. Sorry about the delay. Um, I guess we can get started. Uh, let's just, you can hear me okay, and if Ryan says hi. Hello, hello. Can you hear Ryan all right? Uh, as usual, I'm just my icon self until I get a webcam. <laughs> Okay, we're good. Okay, so let's get started. Um, thanks, Ryan, for joining me today. Uh, I'm Colm Larkin, and I'm here on behalf of Immers Inspire, um, our monthly series chatting to um, game-related people, not always game devs. Um, so today, Ryan Morrison is a games attorney. I'm a games attorney every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thanks for joining me. Um, I have a lot to ask you about, because... Um, Kind of been quite interested in the legal side of things, um, but it's definitely a side of game development that's completely ignored, I would say, when uh, by game devs. Yeah, absolutely, and unfortunately, uh, I like to think that's changing a bit over the past couple of years. Uh, you know, I'm getting more, not only just more inquiries, but more informed inquiries. So it's nice to see that, uh, and hopefully, that's a trend that will keep growing in the right direction. You keep seeing more and more horror stories, so the more people who kind of lose their studio over something silly that could have been handled easily and quickly by an attorney, uh, you know, that, that doesn't happen too many times in a row. Lose their studio. I like it. We'll come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, going to just kind of start with my usual first question. Why, why games? What's your, your reason to be in games? Sure. So, I mean, like everyone of our age group and generation, I played games most of my life. Uh, I did not go to law school to become a game attorney. I had little idea that even existed or it was an industry. Uh, truth be told, it wasn't much of an industry. Uh, the AAA studios that had the lawyers were more big law, the $1,200 an hour kind of attorneys. Uh, we, When I started, I had another gig lined up. When I graduated, I had worked in games for a bit. I worked at an actual game studio, Large Animal Games. Uh, but Candy Crush was trademarking the word candy in Saga and going after a bunch of people, including a versus evil comrade of yours. Yes. And uh, <laughs> Stoic, who just. That's right. They had just done a Kickstarter for Banner Saga. I don't think Banner Saga was out yet, right? No, they had put in the trademark, but yeah. they uh, were opposed on that. And uh, it, while I didn't help them directly, I helped a lot of other people facing similar issues from King. And uh, I went on Reddit basically to say, guys, trademark your stuff and this won't happen. And it was really just kind of a short, quick rant from me while I was still doing the other job and everything else was lined up. And uh, instead of it being, you know, okay or yelling at me, it was uh, a lot of questions. Well, what is a trademark? How do we do that? And that's what led to those weekly AMAs I did and uh, the ability to kind of go into this full time and, and just run with it. So very mutually beneficial relationship. So you, you mentioned weekly AMA. Um, if you're not familiar on Reddit, AMA is ask me anything. So it's basically just starting a thread saying, ask me anything and I'll answer questions. So <laughs> right. Ryan, Ryan's been doing a lot of them as uh, his username is video game attorney or lawyer. I can't yep. remember. Yeah, video game attorney. Video game attorney on Twitter, on Reddit and uh, just post saying, ask me law questions and I'll, I'll answer them. And you've been doing that for, I'd say at least a couple of years. Yeah, I think it's probably right around three years now, and uh, it's been great. You know, and, and really, the questions have changed dramatically. So there's tens of thousands of people, and there are sometimes hundreds of thousands. And it used to be very basic questions, you know, what is a trademark? Now they're asking complex, well, if you have a trademark for this, and there's another class of goods with this, et cetera, et cetera. So it sounds like a, a law school class as opposed to, uh, you know, game developers asking about the law. It's, it's fun. <laughs> so you've kind of seen a bit of maturity there? Yeah, big time. Uh, throughout the entire community and industry, even the, the articles coming out from, you know, Polygon to whoever else, you see they're explaining these issues a lot more in-depthly and the comments are even more intelligent back. And, uh, you know, not that there's anything wrong with not knowing this stuff. Game developers aren't supposed to know this stuff. I can't make a game. I, you know, I can maybe work basic Python. That's about it. Uh, so there's no reason you need to know all this, but it's good to know where the problems lie and where the issues might lie. So you can have an intelligent conversation with your attorney and make sure you're protected. Just to translate that, we we call them solicitors here in Ireland. All oh, right. <laughs> and then if you're in an actual court, it's a different um, person called it's a barrister, barrister, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's why I'm having trouble with lawyer and attorney. I like law talking guy from Simpsons. 
Yes, exactly. <laughs> and in America, lawyer and attorney, lawyer and attorney are the exact same okay. word. There's no difference in job sure. there. You could say attorney at law. That's exactly. It sounds <laughs> cooler. <laughs> so um, maybe let's talk about a few of those basic things. So um, there's three main kind of regions of the law that impact games directly. So copyright, trademarks, and patents um, are probably the three main things that uh, I think most game devs should know at least how they work. Um, sure. So uh, what is copyright? Very basic. Sure. So th there's actually a fourth too, which is trade secrets, which doesn't normally make these conversations, but it's it's almost more important than uh, patents. So mm, nice. a copyright is the uh, a copyright's all your art assets. It's your code. It's all your long form stuff. If you doodle a, a design on a chalkboard, you have a copyright on that. Copyright's automatic. Copyright is very powerful, but it only protects that narrow thing. So and it you're protects writing as well, right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, it's everything. So it's it's uh it's the normal intellectual property protection you think of it, it protects your character art it protects the code it protects your script uh everything so the the uh downside with copyright is it's something you can't do until your game is finalized and ready to launch because any kind of iterations whether it be changing the code around a bit or adding different stuff to it you're you're not going to have the same copyright over those things as you would if you just sent in your finalized product, because then you have it on record, everything in there. So copyright you do at the end of your project. Uh, trademarks, on the other hand, you want to do as soon as possible. Trademarks protect your name, your logo, and your slogan. So it's McDonald's, it's the Golden Arches, and it's their I'm loving it slogan, if that is what they use in Ireland. Uh, so trademark is, is uh, how people recognize your brand. It's the source signifier. It's far and away the most important one here. Uh, it, it has the most broad protection, so you can't name your burger company, you know, McDonald's or anything kind of similar. With uh, the big difference being with copyright, you have to be substantially similar to be infringing. With trademarks, you only have to be confusingly similar. And the test for what is confusing... And the difference it, is confusingly similar. Well, absolutely. <laughs> When you, start, when you start looking at the law, you see the line for confusing is the line of an average person. And in a legal context, an average person is not very intelligent. So if there's any kind of consumer confusion possible, if you name your, your computer company Orange and people think that's too close to Apple, it's potentially possible that that's infringing. However, with copyright, it has to be real close. So it, if you take Mario and you make his hat green, that's not that's going to be infringing but if you take mario and you change how his face looks a little bit that's no longer going to be copyright infringement to a degree please don't go make your own mario brother games uh, you know it, so that's the big two those are certainly the big ones we'll, trade we'll make, secrets we'll make a gianna sisters game yeah exactly that's a real uh, game ah <sighs> uh, man you have no idea some of the things you see. <laughs> uh trade trade secrets are basically everything secret with your company so if you have some kind of uh, code you really like or, or some kind of process you really enjoy. Uh, if you're treating it truly confidential and only your, your inner circle knows and it's on a need to know basis, very possible to protect that. So if so, one of your employees leaves and goes elsewhere, he's not allowed to share that with him or he's violating your trade secrets. So in, in games, what kind of trade secrets would you have like your um, algorithms for um, loot drops in World of Warcraft? Exactly. Okay. You know, what kind of uh, metrics you use to, to see how people scale in your game or whatever it might be. It's, it's some kind of, uh, it's something that wouldn't necessarily be copyrighted because it's not that the code in and of itself is what's protecting you. It's the actual numbers associated with it. It's your actual data. It's the recipe to Coke equivalent here. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff is the trade secret. And Patents, how, how do you yeah, protect sorry. trade secrets? How are, so you copyright is generally automatic just by... Yeah. By publishing, do you have you have to make it public? Copyright has to be published, right? Yeah. Has, well, okay. not even. Copyright has to be in a fixed, tangible medium. So, if you have an idea for something, it's impossible to protect that under most circumstances. Uh, if you want to protect your idea, you have to put it in some kind of tangible form, whether that is flesh out the code or draw the actual character, something and, like and, that. And just have it on paper or on your computer, or do you have to like post it up on Tumblr or? No, nope, you can just have a record of it. You can. It used to be you mailed it to yourself. Now you can email it to yourself. Okay. All of this with the caveat, you know, I'm an American attorney, so there might sure, be yeah, slight differences in Ireland, but not many. Yeah. Uh, the general concept so, is going to be pretty similar. Exactly. And so with the copyright, you want to do a formal registration at the very end of it. Copyright's automatic. You get it no matter what as you're doing it. 
but it's always nice to formally register with the government just so you have a formal record of it. No one's going to accuse you of faking an email, whatever else. Uh, trademarks you want to do as soon as possible again. That's because it takes six months to two years to get a trademark. So you want to make sure your name is okay before you start marketing it and before you go out there. The problem there is you don't actually get your trademark until you are in commerce, until you release. Until you're, so, um, you're asking for money for something, right? In commerce. It can be free, but as okay. long as it's as long as, uh, as long as the public can get it. Okay. Um, you have so to I'm just quote in commerce. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of questions about trademarks here. So uh, this is pretty much exactly what you're saying. Generally speaking, is asking uh, what stage should you trademark your game name? Emperor Cookie seconds that question. When it is when is it no longer safe to not be trademarked? Well, I mean, so look at Stoic and Candy Crush. They didn't even have a game out yet. They had nothing out yet, and they faced serious trademark problems. But they had so, a, a million-dollar Kickstarter. Like, they had a lot on the line. They had but Kickstarter doesn't count as commerce. Yes, exactly. Enough. So they, they, in a, the trademark office's eyes, they had nothing public yet because uh, Kickstarters don't count, which is also important to remember. So if you want to use a name, it's best to go do that trademark even six months before your Kickstarter, just so okay. you have an idea if you're going to get it or not. Uh, because you never know who's going to come and swing at you, and and if you don't have a formally registered trademark, it's potentially a lot of damages, or even worse, you might have to take down your Kickstarter and take down your website, take down your app, whatever, and you lose a lot of progress. You have a big problem there. And the general idea there, or kind of the reason for them, is you have your uh, Kickstarter for the Banner Saga, and Candy Crush Saga is a huge app on mobile at the time. And the idea there is that people go to Kickstarter and go, oh, cool, it's related to Candy Crush Saga somehow. I'll totally back that because I love that mobile game. Yeah, that's I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the idea. Right? That's why it was so ridiculous. But that is yes. the idea there. And, you know, that does make sense with uh, other versions of it where it is, you know, confusing. Um, yeah. Okay. But trademarks takes a lot of time and work. Uh, they're quite expensive. Yeah, I mean, so the, the filing fees aren't anything crazy. They actually, in America, just lowered our filing fees. Uh, but I would say in, in the UK and, and EU, by you guys, you're looking at about 2500 for an EU trademark done properly through an attorney. Mm -hmm. In America, it's about half that, uh, maybe even a little cheaper. Uh, the difference being you guys get a lot more up front there in terms of... Uh, so to get super legalese for a minute, trademarks are broken up into classes of goods. So Apple brand computers, totally fine. Apple brand apples, not okay, because it would describe what the product is. It would be ridiculous. Also, it's important that if you did have Domino's pizza, you are not going to be infringing on Domino's computer parts. They're just unrelated. No one's going to confuse the two. So in the with an EU trademark, you get three classes of goods up front. You can get your game so you studio, you can merch. get t-shirts, yeah. exactly. In America, you pay per class. So we are ch way cheaper, but you get a little less protection. Not anything substantial. We have Steam here. We have Valve here. We have Apple here. We have Google here. Uh, I know you guys also have them there, but their formal corporate head yep. headquarters usually are in America. So the American trademark is usually not only cheaper, but also a lot more powerful for game developers. Once you start making a ton of money, get them all. But as, as the kind of entryway into protection, I would recommend an American trademark in most cases and, uh, and to do that as early as possible, which you can expect to run you about $1,000 through uh, a, a, you know, a smaller law office like myself up to about five grand if you go to a big law, which there's no reason for that. Or, don't, uh, don't they have nicer suits? Yeah, they have much nicer <laughs> suits that you pay for. <laughs> as you can see from my couch, I don't charge that much. <laughs> uh, no, but in all seriousness, the, so you can do a trademark yourself. The reason I would never recommend that is because so something like LegalZoom, last I checked, and I, you know, I, I have I don't want a defamation lawsuit, so these numbers might not be a hundred percent accurate, but we, they have something like a five percent success rate. LegalZoom is like a a tool to let you po um. Put, yeah, it's your own an trademark. online website that helps yes. you fill out legal forms, but they don't actually add anything. There's no legal advice, so there's still user error there. And with trademarks, when you're describing your class of goods, there's so much room for user error. Even through an attorney, you can run into a lot of road bumps, as, as you may or may not know. And, uh, you know, there's going to be the way to fix that through a law office that's just not available usually yeah. because you don't have all the case law to recite. You don't have all the legalese to throw at them. And... There's a huge difference why, you know, my law office has a 95% success rate and LegalZoom has like a 5% success rate. And that's not a commercial. That's true for most yeah, trademark. I mean, trainers. that makes sense. 
Um, and the kind of money you're saving there is not that much, about half kind of the figure you... Exactly. Yeah, yes. it's not that much. Because so... LegalZoom is big on advertising. Oh, it's $100 for a trademark, but they don't tell you about all the government fees and everything else yeah. you're going to have to be paying throughout the process. Okay, so that those fees, so you're looking at one to one and a half thousand euro per trademark in the US, say, um, double that for an EU-wide version. That still only covers me in the US and uh, Europe-wide um then you have to start going country by country you know canada australia there are bigger markets and then what about all of south america all of asia china is can you even trademark things in china well i mean it's a whole can of worms isn't it yeah you, you can have a trademark in china i don't recommend it uh you know there's there's not a lot of actual protection there okay. in terms of all the other countries that's a very common question and it's something that's that's definitely important there is the Madrid protocol, which is something that allows you to apply in a ton of countries at once. You still have to pay all those government fees. You still have to go through an attorney for that. And uh, you need local representation if anything goes wrong there. So it gets expensive very quickly, but it's, uh, you know, it's definitely something to heavily consider once you start bringing in a ton of money with your game. Up front, as an indie dev or even a mid-level studio, even a bigger studio that's not making the millions and millions yet, there's no reason to go worldwide. It's uh, if you have your EU protection and your US protection, that's huge. Okay. If you're an Australian game dev, then also get Australia. If you're a Canadian game dev, also get Canada. Those two countries in particular don't really play ball with the rest of the world in terms of IP. Uh, but it, it's not something that you need to deplete your entire bank account to get trademarks. Yeah. Okay. So um, good advice there for a smaller company. If you're if you are publishing a game, and you intend to make money off it. Uh, look at the price of a trademark and weigh that weigh that against, um, you know, potential. Well, let's actually talk about that. The downsides of not being trademarked. So you launch your game. You've you've done your homework. You know, you are careful about choosing a name. You're not trying to infringe anyone. Uh, but someone, a big studio, has a game they haven't announced yet, and they've quietly trademarked it, and it's really similar to yours. That could happen. Oh yeah, big time. Uh, um, there's a, that happens frequently where where. Uh, you know what's funny? Mattel, who makes the Hot Wheels cars, I don't know yep. if those are popular. Yeah, we have them. Yeah, so they, they, uh, they, not maliciously, they truly do have all these things. You know, they're, they're not trying to be jerks about it, but they trademark all their Hot Wheels names. And they come out with a thousand Hot Wheel cars a month, it seems, okay. because I get bounced back with my game studios so much over these Mattel Hot Wheels trademarks. And just as we just talked Classic Goods, it doesn't sound like that would be the same Classic Goods, but, but you have to keep in mind toys. who. Yeah, and you have to keep in mind who these trademark examiners are. They don't know what a video game is. That's a game to them, and Hot Wheels are a game. So it's all in that game class. We've never lost that once we actually go in and fight it, but that kind of fight is way more expensive if Mattel comes after you as opposed to you having your trademark in the first place. So you're making your racing game. It's called McWheels. I don't know. Right. Um, you, you, let's say, run a Kickstarter. It's doing really well. Mattel just what send you a letter saying uh, take that down McWheels is our trademarked you know new car that's coming out next week yeah and, and they don't owe you that letter which is very important to remember so a okay. lot of people on reddit always say oh well you know I'm gonna do it until I get a cease and desist letter they don't owe you that they can sue you outright which absolutely happens or they can you know what's more common is just take you out of the app store or take you off steam uh, completely destroy your game studio because that's your your game your livelihood uh, it would be as if you know your 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 main title you've put five years into all of a sudden just disappears and you have no recourse to fight it. That's going to be quicker than six months time because you don't have your trademark. And yes, you can have your attorney get on the phone with them and try to negotiate a deal, but they're not going to budge more often than not. And that's not a sh I don't mean to make this a shot at Mattel. It's not at all. They they are no better or worse than anyone else. They've actually worked with me on quite a few deals. Uh, but there's a lot of companies out there with a lot of trademarks. Uh, gambling companies, the casinos, they trademark every one of their slot machine names, and those are "quote unquote" gaming machines. And they have money, right? They have like <laughs> they, they have, they have the, like Mr. Burns nice. button that lifts up the wall, and there's the team of attack lawyers. Exactly, they are they are absolutely not nice or willing to work with you in most cases. So that's something scary to do. Uh, the other stuff is basically you want to, uh, and just as a, a caveat, also. Uh, as, as much as trademarks you need a lawyer for, filing your formal copyright at the end of your game is something that you can figure out in 15 minutes of research. That you don't need a lawyer for. And that's only about $35. And so does, that, can... does that really help you much more than kind of 
it's nice because so to sue someone or at least for your own cease and desist to have any weight behind you it just have a little nice reference yeah no 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 you actually can't sue someone unless your copyright is registered oh good so to you, know. you yeah you get protection over it as soon as you create something meaning someone can't sue you necessarily but if you want to pressure anyone else out of stop stealing your stuff you need to uh have your copyright registered and again is that region by region is that yeah, start, well, start so that, in the U.S., do a Europe one? Yeah, that's country by country, but that one uh, more so I would always do locally first because if you are going to sue someone, you're going to want to sue them locally. Sure. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, good advice. Um, kind of pulling back to trademarks. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we were just talking about uh, what, what could go wrong if you don't do it and the amount of time it takes. So it can take a long time, like a, six months, like one year would be, probably pretty standard from when you start the process to get granted a trademark everything going quite well right exactly that that's a pretty good time estimate uh we we always say six months to two years but we always expect a year okay and uh it's it's something that you want to do yeah sooner than later so <clears throat> there's two kinds of ways to apply for a trademark uh that are the two big ones anyway the first being intent to use and the second being in commerce already so Intent to use is what I'm telling you all to file, which is where you do it as soon as possible. You make sure your name is free and clear. Then you start marketing. Then you come out with your game. Then you submit one more form that's another $100, and uh, you get your formally fully registered trademark when you go to commerce. So one thing that helped me when we did this um, for Gilded Engineering was I had been taking pre-orders. So that counted as in commerce. So we just skipped that step and went straight to an in-commerce application. And it was a really small amount. It was a very like a handful of people that bought the game but that's also going to be very dependent on what examiner you get so okay. uh pre-orders i've even gotten kickstarter a few uh, through a few times but i know that categorically they don't usually accept kickstarter uh pre-orders anything that says coming soon or demo or anything mm -hmm. like that even alpha beta early release you can get kicked back for that interesting so uh, okay so yeah. it's it, it's a case-by-case -case basis there yeah yeah sure okay um if people have more questions about trademarks, just let me know. We have uh, some questions here about a uh, recent suit. Um, let's talk about that and then kind of come back to maybe patents and trade secrets. Uh, sure. So a few people, you you are paranoid. <laughs> Good name. <laughs> Retro Neo Games and Emperor Cookie are all asking about Hello Games. So the No Man's Sky dev, they're in a lawsuit now about Super Formula. So you are paranoid asks, can a company license a mathematical equation? Uh, Retro Neo Games is wondering about the Danish company, so I don't know much about this. Um, Ryan, do yeah, you? Yeah, and admittedly, neither do I. I know, I know the, You've the heard highlights. About it? Okay, yeah, the cool. bullet points. Uh, yeah. And it's an interesting case that, so with copyright, how it protects your code and things like that, copyright doesn't normally protect what's considered functional. So something that you need to make your, your product, which math equations oftentimes will fall under. What, what math equations might be protected by is, is like we said, trade secrets. Trade so secret. if you came up with this new beautiful way to do something and you're truly protecting it, it's something that you could potentially trade secret. It's also something you could potentially patent, although not usually. Uh, so that that's something to, to keep in mind. And that's also something that's going to differ very much country to country. So I'm unsure how it would look in the EU. Uh, but that that's definitely something that... Uh, you know, that's when you get to the real nitty gritty of intellectual property law, of when you start t dealing with functional stuff. And a math equation is certainly gonna fall into that category. So I don't know enough to comment on this case specifically, but uh, you know, generally that's that's the, the issue there. So it's interesting because Retro Neo Games uh, brings up the, the timing of it, which is that Hello Games, we're talking about it over the last couple of years and the company that have a trademark or may or may not have uh, are suing them, I believe. I'm just going from what um, Retro Neo Games is saying. Um, is that they've just brought it up now, like weeks before release? Is that so, you think because it's they're about to make a lot of money? I mean, it's de it's definitely possible. It's that. It's also possible it wasn't on their radar yet. I mean, Disney doesn't sue Star Wars games until they start making money or until they get a sure. little notoriety because so they many. just don't have. Yeah, they they're not going to find them all. Also, what's important to remember here is, like I said, talking about it means nothing. They haven't committed any kind of infringement or crime if they're talking about it. Sure. When they actually release it, then all of a sudden it's infringing, and that's the only time this company can do anything about it. Could they have sent a friendly letter sooner? Probably, but they truly might not have known, or they might now see dollar signs. I, I really don't know about this one in particular. Yeah. It sounds like 
they've just Hello Games have just talked about this formula, so there's no confirmation of them having used it or not. So it's like, a, can can you sue someone just to find out? You no. Say we think uh, you might have. Not. We think you might have, you know, infringed on us because you talked about it in this interview. Yeah, I mean, if so, if they have any kind of evidence that that maybe an ex employee works with them now, or maybe okay. they had access to something, you know, it, it's really hard to guess because yeah, there's a yeah. thousand reasons why it could be possible. But uh, if they're just talking about something, that's almost never enough of a reason to sue someone. Granted, you can sue anyone for anything; you don't have to be right. But to to get past summary judgment, which is where a judge says, "Is there any basis for this?" and to actually get to discovery where they're going to be able to see if they're using that code, uh, that's that's harder to do. I actually knows what those things mean because we've been watching the good, the good wife. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing up that might be why you've noticed your AMAs. You know, people know a little more. It's a lot, just the good wife. A lot more good law, you know, on TV. It's um, daredevil suits. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so can we talk about maybe like um, things that can go wrong law wise for a new new developer so we're suggest you know you're obviously uh, recommending trademarks is the number one thing to do trademark your company name your studio name company um, and your game name um, yeah I would say there's a top three and trademarks is one of them but I would say do all of these or you're asking for trouble uh, employee contracts is, yeah yeah the other one is, is uh, a lot of people start these studios with a friend or someone mm -hmm. they met on a forum and uh, they get a partner out of nowhere and they just say, you know, we, we're buddies, so we're just going to make this work. The, the most important thing is always first get a partnership agreement, form a company and get an operating agreement, whatever you want to do, but get something on paper that says how this relationship is going to work, what everybody's responsibilities are, and really know who owns what going forward. Otherwise, you're going to hate each other or someone's going to fall in love and move halfway across the world or the game's not going to be doing well and the other guy needs to get a job somewhere else. Whatever happens, if he leaves without an agreement in place, he owns half the IP, uh, even if he didn't contribute much. If you're acting as a partnership, you are a partnership. Okay. So you really need to write down whether you are or not, what the relationship actually is, what percentages everybody owns, and where the intellectual property is going to rest. Uh, otherwise, the, you're never going to see the light of day. It, I, the, the thing I just tweeted about the other day was... Uh, breeding season or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I was about to bring that up. <laughs> it was the it's the for people who haven't been following this, it was the number one Patreon um <laughs> thing and it was people making a sexy adult breeding game for furries basically it looked like yes it and, was harvest moon for furries. Yeah and it was making <laughs> uh over forty thousand dollars each month on donations. There was no game. They were just working on it and showing art now and again. And the whole thing fell apart. The uh, partners um, fell out with each other and started posting on Tumblr all their like chat logs and angry, angry things. But one really interesting thing is one of them posted his uh, agreement, the two partners agreement. And basically the, it was a, a programmer and an artist, say, I think, uh, or a producer and an artist. So the artist's um, agreement said the artist owned all rights for his art. Which so, is insane. So the so game itself, <laughs> if they had released it, still didn't have a right to like right. <laughs> publish the art that the guy um, created. And so many people and developers still do this where they say, oh, you know, I want to be a nice guy. I want to let the artist keep his stuff. There's no reason for that. You're not being a bad guy by having ownership of the game you're releasing. If you're paying an artist to do art for your game, that's it. You should own it. If you want to give him revenue share or something like that, fine. But he shouldn't be able to go make his own game like he's doing here. Or, or uh, most importantly, pull it, like force you to not release your game. Exactly. So yeah. what, what, what most game developers do not realize is if you pay, let's say you're a programmer or producer or even just a game studio, you find an artist you really like and you say, hey, artist, you know, make all this character art for me. I'll give you $10,000 and we'll call it a day. Everyone assumes, okay, great, now I have the license to use this art, or, or more accurately, most people assume, okay, I own this art now. That's absolutely not true. Uh, without a proper contractor agreement and an assignment of the intellectual property clause, you can pay him whatever you want, but he still retains ownership of it. And what that contractor might do later, right before release, is come back and say, well, now I want 50% revenue share or you can't release the game with my art. Or even worse, you just can't use my art at all and now you can't release your game. Uh, you always want to make sure you have a proper contractor agreement there because so much of the game dev industry uses contractors and so few of them use the proper agreement. Um, and further to that, I believe in Ireland, it's important to get anyone who contributes to your um, game or studio or company. So um, someone doing freelance work for you for your website, someone like programming, writing code, 
uh, they retain their IP in kind of the same way by default. So you want to, you want a very simple contract that just says company name or game studio or game owns the IP for anything we create. And uh, it, you know, so it, it seems expensive to do all this stuff and to, to kind of say, all right, I need a trademark. Now I need a partnership agreement. Now I need a contractor agreement. The, uh, you, you can get it all for not that much money. And the nice thing with most of this stuff, especially the contractor agreement, is you can use it for all your future contractors too. Most attorneys will work with you on how to tweak something so you don't need a new one for everybody you hire until you are one of those huge AAA studios where you can afford individual agreements for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you're on a shoestring, get a, get a template and start with that. Those are really, you know, isn't that better than nothing? Uh, sometimes, uh, <laughs> although a, a lot of, so with a partnership, with a partnership agreement, absolutely. Yes. Categorically that that's going to be almost always better than nothing with a contractor agreement. There's a, a very popular website floating around in the game dev industry, uh, called do contract or yes, contract yeah. or something like that. That has caused so many problems and so many studios to actually have to break up that wow. it's crazy. Uh, the, the, it's, it was made with good intentions. I'm not insulting it at all. I know the people involved. I, I, they're you know, good guys who really want to help people who can't afford stuff. But the problem is almost all of it is user input and user generated. And when you do that, it allows for user error. And I've seen things where I've seen a ton of them where it says this agreement is under American law. And we don't have American law. Our law is state-based. So it would have to be okay, under New York yeah. law or California law. On so top the whole of that, thing is void. It's just lots of problems. It's not void. It's tax fraud because uh which is serious and leads to real implications because they if you're a contractor it means you're not withholding co uh, taxes you're not giving them proper benefits you're not doing a ton of stuff and if you make the job description going to help with art for the game or something like that that's far too broad and that's what an employment contract looks like and if you're not an employee and you're a contractor or vice versa and you screwed up the contract by putting in all this data on a website incorrectly you are now potentially committing very serious tax fraud, which is even worse in Europe because you guys actually have things like healthcare and stuff. <laughs> so it's worse in the US? It's worse in Europe where you guys, uh, you, you guys pay taxes. Oh, we pay higher stuff. taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. true. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So you don't want to blur that line over there. Again, this is something that most attorneys will help you understand for free, or you can just go look at one of my MAs and I've put the line out there very clearly about okay. at least in America, what the difference is, but that's, it's very similar to the EU uh, for sure. And, and you want to make sure that you're basically just so everyone listening knows you don't want to have a contractor who has an essential day to day job. If your company can't run without that contractor, they're not a contractor. They're an employee or they're a partner. If uh, you're, your what, contract... what about a short term contract? So Does that's that fine, exist? but you have, yeah, you have to be very narrow and clear okay. in those contracts. So you can't say going to do the art. You can't have, say going being art director, contractor. Yeah. You know, art director is not going to be contractor. But you can say coming in to draw the 17 character designs for the, the, the game or something like that or coming in to draw all the card art or whatever. Uh, that's okay as long as you're being very narrow and clear in the descriptions. Coming in to consult on concept art and art direction, much like an art director might. You, but seriously, that's, that's the way to do it. <laughs> you should have been a lawyer. <laughs> I love playing, uh, you know, the, the bad guy, yeah. kind of <laughs> putting up, you know, versions that are just annoying. Exactly. Um, okay, that's very interesting. Um, so kind of related to that. So that's, um, well, actually, you, this was number two of three. Trademarks, contract agreements or agreements with partners. You mentioned so I actually meant those two is two and three. Oh, okay. So, par so partnership agreement partnerships and, contractor. and, and uh, contractor or employee contracts. Okay. Um, we'll make the fourth talk to an attorney. Consultations are free. Go over your problems with, with me or someone else. It's really not a commercial. You know, there's Irish attorneys who mm -hmm. I'm sure are great. Go call someone and just have a quick 15, 30 minute chat with them and know where your red flags are. Every studio is going to be different. Every game is different. Everybody's going to have different issues. But it's always worth to have that free conversation with a lawyer. Most of us aren't that scary. I know it's intimidating to call a law office, but it, it's the right move every time. And in your case, we can start with an email, which is easy. Exactly. Uh, emails very, are preferred, actually. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, I will drop in a link for everyone to your URL in a minute. Um, so there's another one, I think, particularly in games, which is if you are dealing with a publisher, um, 
that yes. contract is very very scary and long and can um seriously mess up your your future as a game studio if you just sign it without reading it um especially you, in ireland you guys are are like prime targets right now because your game industry has just kind of very recently exploded and every irish game dev we work with sends us a publisher agreement that is just straight up robbery they're not giving you anything more than a you know maybe a few thousand dollars or maybe they're helping with some marketing or tweets and they ask for something ridiculous in return like ownership of the ip or 40 percent of revenue or whatever it might be it's mm -hmm. just absolutely ludicrous and it's it's uh please don't sign those things without talking to somebody yes and i wholeheartedly um agree with you there that is probably the most important contract to get you know scrutinized and get help with absolutely help with. um you actually wrote, I think, recently about uh, kind of <laughs> borderline scam publishers. So there's a few publishers going around saying, we'll, we'll totally like, you know, help you with marketing. We'll send some tweets. Um, we'll give away copies of your game as a popular one, um, yeah. as if that's marketing. Um, <laughs> right. But you shared, uh, I think, a picture of, of like uh, one of the I agreements. I shared, shared the contract. Yeah, yeah absolutely. and w like, it was awful. There was no commitment on their point. They got uh, say 30 or 50% um, revenue. If you canceled the agreement, they got 15% still... <laughs> of gross revenue forever, which is ridiculous. Um, so basically there's, there are really scummy publishers out there. Yeah. Ultra, let, ultra shock can... gaming was the name. I just had to okay. look it up. So just, I don't mind, I don't mind calling people out as necessary. So ultra shock gaming, I wouldn't sign with them. Sure. <laughs> um, so basically it, it's kind of, be careful, do your homework. I, I would highly suggest, and I usually advise this, is go ask other game devs. So yes. game, de game devs are really open with helping other game devs. We have nothing to lose. We're not really in direct competition. We're certainly not in competition for uh, publisher contracts specifically. Um, so um, ask other game devs. If you're trying to find out more about a publisher, go ask the people they've published. They're gonna tell you upfront how good or bad they are. Um, and yes look at the contract and this is something that a lot of people don't realize negotiate the contract yes a first offer is an offer always we've never ever ever signed an agreement that was given to us by a publisher without substantial red lines and we've also never lost an, a, an agreement we've never lost a deal by negotiating so always ask for more and more and more and you, you don't want to be the high school band who gets offered a record label deal you know don't don't treat your game and your studio like it's something that you know you're so excited to work with a publisher you'll sign anything read through it calmly by yourself and see what am i getting out of this what am i giving out of this and is that a fair trade and, and you can I'd add to that even... if if yeah. thing if things go bad what is written in there how does that work exactly so if they don't do their job or you don't do your job what what is the wording there so that and if, if things very important if things go really well generally speaking all the weird clauses in the contract never get looked at again right <laughs> if things Contracts go really bad things explode. all yeah. the lawyers go and read the contract again and find problems <laughs> absolutely okay so um we kind of were kind of skipped over patents so yeah, i, so I believe they're not that, that important in <laughs> games Right. Patents basically don't exist in game dev. And that, that's an unfair and stupid statement to come from an attorney. They do exist. But no one watching this and no one in the future is probably going to ever have a patent in video games anymore. Uh, in America, we've basically categorically banned or weakened to a point where they're, they're useless software patents. Uh, EU is a little less you know, crazy than that, but there's just it's very difficult to get a patent. We're talking about you know, ten to $15,000 just to submit the application and get it approved, then you need hundreds of thousands of dollars to actually enforce it. So the only time patents become an issue for you guys is usually when some other big company has a patent and they're coming after you. And unfortunately, it's kind of like getting struck by lightning. It's really, really difficult to prepare for that or to do a patent search and see if your game's gonna conflict with it. If it happens, it sucks, it's potentially life ruining, but it's not something you can really prepare for. Well, I guess one little thing you could do there is make sure you're formed a company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you so go. So this is kind of super basic <laughs> advice. If you're making a game as a hobby, sure. If you want to charge money for it, I would say definitely form a company because that gives you limited liability 
which uh, very briefly means if you accidentally or even maliciously make a game that's like Mario Bros and makes loads of money and they sue you for loads of money, you don't lose your house. Right, you they you can lose, sue your company. Yeah, the you. company loses everything, but not you personally. So I guess that would be some form no, of you're right. help that's if you're abs- accidentally losing everything through a patent. We skipped over that for sure. That's the way to go. <laughs> so there's lots, lots of layers and details here, um, and it can be a little scary, particularly when you're really trying to focus on just making a game, which is hard enough. Yeah, I mean, so that's another thing, though. You guys are just trying to make games, and that's why, you know, I, I can change my own oil. I used to work at a mechanic shop for 10 years, actually, before I was an attorney. But I still bring my car to the mechanic to get things done because I'm doing other things with my life. I'm busy. I don't have time to do all this stuff. And same with this this legal stuff. Yeah, you can probably research and figure out how trademarks work and do a proper application. But at some point, you just have to say, I want this done right by an expert. And you can go to my law office or, or offices like mine and you can pay $3,500, which sounds like all the money in the world, but that's for everything. That's to get the trademark. That's for your agreement. That's for your to form an actual company. That's for the contract agreement in terms of service and privacy policy. For $3,500 to $5,000, depending on, on where you're at, you can just put all this stuff out of your mind and really know you're operating safely and securely. And it's, again, that's a ton of money. I, I know not everyone has that, but it's the kind of stuff where if you're starting a business, Businesses have startup costs, and a lot of those startup costs, as a as a video game developer, which has very little overhead, are legal fees. You know, you guys get to start companies a lot cheaper than most other people. Yep, and Ireland is very cheap to set up a company as well. Which I am unfamiliar with, but I'm, I believe sure, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's not that much work. You probably get an accountant here to do it, but. Um... You can set up not crazy. companies in America super easy by yourself. Uh, in almost all, there's about three states I don't recommend it in. But other than that, it's like a copyright where, with minimal research, you can do it. Uh, it's it's those other things that take the, the time and effort. Um, okay, so I have a question, um, bringing us in a different way, which is kind of around. I'm not sure for the right term for this is, but essentially, Ali Moss uh, is an artist. Um, really cool, kind of. Um, he got very very famous doing kind of um, movie posters. Um, he's a really talented artist, um, but he worked on Firewatch, a really cool game, right. as, the, as the lead artist. Uh, and just recently he put up a limited edition print, which was using the Overwatch characters. So why is he allowed to do that? Uh, so there's there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one, he's not. So if you know if he's doing it without permission, that's infringement almost certainly. Uh, you know, so the homages or fan art or even everything on DeviantArt or you'll find on forums that fans of a genre make, that's all infringing. The difference is, you know, they're, Blizzard's not going to go around suing well-liked and famous people over one little goofy fan fun art. Or probably he has a license to do it. He said, hey, Blizzard, can I use these guys in a poster? I'll give you 30% of the profits and we're all hunky-dory. All of those agreements are going to have a confidentiality clause, so we'll probably never know. But that would be a, a huge guess on my part as to how that's allowed. Uh, Blizzard has no- notoriously never licensed out their IP in the past. But with Overwatch, I know firsthand they have been a little more loose with it. So uh, that's definitely a big reason why. It's also you know frustrating when those things do happen unchecked and unexplained. We have uh, you know the KOTOR remake or something like that. And people say, hey, if this guy can make a Star Wars game, why can't I? If, the, if he's not charging for it, doesn't that make it okay? No, absolutely not. It doesn't matter if it's free or it's, it costs a million dollars. They're both still infringing. They're both potentially life ruining for you. Stick to your own IP unless you have permission to do otherwise. So I'm just going to mention uh, between the berries and me is just mentioning about Firewatch versus Overwatch. This story impacts both things. It's Ali Moss, who's the artist on Firewatch. And I just posted there his tweet. He made a, a print that you can see it's the Overwatch characters, but he doesn't mention Overwatch in it. So it's, it's interesting. Is that yeah? And, and actually, with this, he might not even have permission. He might, he really might just you know. It's you know, clearly in his style. It doesn't say Overwatch. It doesn't say the character names. But it, you know, you can clearly see they're there. Oh characters. yeah. Well, Blizzard has also been so. Just a fun little tangent. Uh, when when Overwatch first released, I got twenty emails from different websites that were making Overwatch porn and uh, <laughs> doing very similar stuff to this, except you know, Pharaoh would be kissing Mercy. 
And uh, it was a similar art styles, or sometimes it was great art styles. Regardless, they were all getting shut down by Blizzard, and they were saying, isn't this fair use? Aren't we allowed to do this? No, absolutely not. So, you know, we didn't really assist with them on that. So but, uh, yeah. possibly what's happening there is that Blizzard are like, well, Ali Moss is super cool. Right. And his use of it, you know, it's okay. It makes us look okay. Well, the people making porn versions, you're like, no, that's like making our game look bad. Our game is not an adult game like that, you know. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, this is a very popular artist, so Blizzard yes, might, yeah. might say, this is cool, you know, this is great promotion for us, exactly, we're going to let yeah. it ride. Or maybe he went and talked to them, because he is really... Yeah, he, you, he is you really never know. Um, okay, no, it's just something Blizzard, that came up recently that I was wondering. Yeah, no one wants that headline, very popular artist sued by Blizzard for making one little fun design. But that's different than if, you know, you or I do it, because we don't have a following as an artist, and Blizzard's going to say, take our stuff down, you idiot. <laughs> Especially our crude drawings. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so PR is an interesting angle. Um, suing, you know, they can be in the right, but it, they look bad doing it. So that is kind of, kind of how Stoic and the Banner Saga got to stay as the Banner Saga. King just looked like uh, mean. Like it was clearly not going to cause any confusion. If anything, the Banner Saga, a Viking game, has much more claim to the word saga. They just, you know, trademarked it first essentially um you know they it just became a huge pr disaster well, everyone was writing about it they were clearly looked bad uh, as i understand it they basically went okay okay um you guys can use it i actually don't think that's accurate i don't know that uh i don't have any inside baseball knowledge here i don't represent stoic but i do have a pretty clear understanding from the trademark office that this that king basically backed off on candy and the stuff that i was working on a lot uh, on this hand, they, they it seems Stoic kind of played ball and might be in some kind of uh, permission to use Saga in their game. So it's it's uh, I don't know that, that King backed off on that one. But that said, the PR side of things is always very, very important. So before my guys defend something or sue somebody or do anything, we always look at how Twitter and Reddit are going to react. Because you don't want to destroy your company over asserting rights over a small studio. Because they just look so bad. Exactly. Okay. And that's an interesting angle. So just, I, I don't have insider knowledge either, but on yeah. Stoic Studios' website, right down the bottom, they say, Stoic is pleased to come to an agreement with King regarding Stoic's The Banner Saga trademark. It, exactly. So they do have which, a trademark for The Banner Saga, which is interesting. Do they have the trademark? Uh, I or assume. they have an agreement with King? They have an agreement with King regarding Stoic's The Banner Saga trademark. So that sounds like they do. It's that's some lawyer talk though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, we don't know the details there, but it's interesting. Um, so I'm just going to briefly ask you about cloning. So this Thank happens in games a lot. Right. Okay. Um, cloning. So I think the most well reported uh, kind of instance of this was um, ridiculous fishing. If you remember them, uh, yeah. Vlambeer were involved with that. They had this free flash game. Uh, called, it was a slightly different name, uh, Radical Fishing or something like that. Um, and someone came out on mobile and made a, a very direct clone of it um, with different art and different name, um, but the exact same gameplay. And they didn't really have a legal recourse, right? Well, so the, it, it, the, again, I know this is such a ridiculous thing and, and uh, it sounds like law class, but if it is substantially similar as a clone, Apple will take that down. Uh, it'll help immensely if you formally register your copyright, but uh, you do have recourse here. So a lot of people throw their arms up in the air and say, this sucks, I can't do anything, I can't afford a lawyer. You don't need a lawyer. You can go to the, the Apple App Store and submit a takedown request yourself. Uh, the problem is Apple doesn't really follow the law of any country. They, they've basically said, we're rich, come sue us. Uh, but that said, if it's really egregious, oftentimes they will help you. Uh, so, so clones are a huge problem and will always be a huge problem, but the more protections you take and the more assertive you are over protecting your IP, the more you can do to prevent them from, from truly damaging your, your stuff. So in, in the case I'm mentioning, so it was called, it was a web game called Radical Fishing. Vlambeer are a Dutch, uh, indie studio that are really well known for Nuclear Throne at the moment, for example, but a whole lot of other games. And they were making, they were going to make an iOS version of it and a different company made a game called Ninja Fishing with the exact same mechanics. So you go downwards. Um, mechanics are not protectable. Exactly. And then you come <laughs> back up and then instead of shooting the things, I think you cut them with a ninja sword. But it was a really, really obvious clone to people. But I think... That's so they didn't. Yeah. They didn't copy the name. They didn't copy the art. 
Yeah, then you're out of luck almost always. Okay. But what's interesting in this um, is it became a huge PR uh, win for Vlambeer. They got a oh. lot of press about it. And then they re released, rad uh, it was called Ridiculous Fishing when they released it on iOS. And I think it was like <laughs> heavily featured by Apple and it did really well for them. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, listen, I you can look at my Twitter and Reddit and see I'm no stranger to, to big headlines using those to an advantage in a, in a lawsuit when necessary if I think someone's really getting bullied or beat up unfairly. Uh, you know, I know when someone doesn't have money and I know they can't afford a two-year litigation. So the other way to do that is you make a press release and you let people know that big evil corporation is hurting little indie guy. And that's not some narrative from a movie. That's a real thing here. The big companies, intellectual property up until very recently has always been the land of kings, meaning you needed $200,000 to have to, a trademark. Yeah. And it's expensive to fight, which means totally. if, you, if you don't have money, you don't get to play basically. You used to have to sue someone and suing someone can cost $100,000 easy. So now we have all these other ways around that. We have the DMCA takedowns, which everyone hates, but actually is a great idea in theory because it lets penniless indies defend themselves. You have more opportunities to also just say, no, 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 we're not infringing. Look at this, look at here. And now you have Reddit and Twitter and elsewhere to say, look at who's suing me. How messed up is this? That kind of communication and broadcasting didn't exist 10 years ago. So it's, it's a new world right now. Um, Which is an obvious and dumb thing to say, but <laughs> <laughs> I have a question here. Just th this comes up a lot about trademarks. Um, the idea that companies with a trademark need to um, f fight them or protect them need to be uh, seen to be protecting their trademark, or that it might be taken away. Would that so be a reason? There, that's a very common thing that people say all the time. And by the letter of the law, yes, you can lose your rights to your trademark if you're not properly asserting. It, uh, rights over it, meaning if you don't, if you see a clone and you don't stop them, you can potentially lose your your trademark. In reality, that happens never. It, okay. I mean, it happens, but it happens never uh, <laughs> in a, in a, in a non legal meaning of that word. Uh, so it's not something. For example, if King didn't do this with Banner Saga, no one would have ever tried to assert, "Oh my God, Candy Crush Saga is not protecting its IP. They they're going to lose their trademark." That's not. It's not that crazy. But if Disney doesn't go around shutting down the millions of Star Wars, you know, it, so if another Star Wars movie comes out and Disney allows it to happen and doesn't stop it, that kind of major yeah, okay. thing might, might make it work. Okay. Uh, and then um, kind of going in a new space here. So um, between the berries of me is asking, has Ryan had to deal with anything regarding AR and VR, augmented reality, <laughs> virtual reality? Do you have any thoughts about game systems that are integrated into our bodies? So I guess that's yeah. looking into the future a bit. Sure. So uh, I, I'll plug that I do a podcast called Robot, Robot Congress, and every week we look at uh, the future meeting technology because I'm super interested in that. I okay. think that it's uh, it's crazy how you know these laws are written for newspapers and we're using them for augmented reality. Uh, also, our mutual friend John Turp is Mr. VR, so he uh, he he keeps me up to up to speed on a lot of stuff. Uh, and we're lucky enough as a firm to work with a lot of companies making both. Uh, I think VR is something that, you know, is super exciting for the living room and something that is going to be a fun experience. Maybe the way we look through, you know, apartments we want to rent or whatever. A lot of applications for it. But AR, augmented reality, is what I'm, I'm really excited for in terms of uh, advancing society. Just how there's going to be so many uses for it. There's also so many legal headaches for it. You know, do you have to make your Google Glass shut off when you enter a bathroom? How do you enforce that? Do you have to, you know, uh, is there going to be an issue if you trip and fall while using augmented reality because it, it for a second, mm. covered your whole viewpoint? You know, there's there's an endless amount of stuff there that, uh, oh, and John's in the chat. There's, a, there's an endless amount of stuff there that is, is potentially uh, going to cause huge legal headaches. But in the long and short answer is nothing is going to be very different. So uh, you don't need a substantially different terms of service. You don't need any kind of different trademarks. You don't need any kind of different legal protections yet. We'll see how AR goes and we'll see where things kind of wind up. But as it stands right now, you know, it's not really augmented reality. But the Pokemon Go app, everyone's calling it that. It's close enough, I guess. Uh, that you know, they're not going to get in trouble for somebody walking off a cliff using it. They're not going to get in trouble for someone getting in a car accident while using it. They, you, they don't owe any extra duty just because it uses your camera to have fun with. Yeah. 
Uh, unless they do something actually malicious, like uh, sure, yeah, they recording or something, or, recording or something, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, um, that is pretty interesting. I'm just asking if there's any more questions, but otherwise, I think we're kind of clean. That was a pretty good tour of all things law related to games. Yeah. <laughs> um, if any of our members or any game devs listening or any of the other um, game devs in Ireland wanted to contact you, um, I've posted a link there. It's um, morrisonlee.com um should they email you tweet you yeah so i mean definitely i mean feel free to tweet me about what's going on in your life but i can't give legal advice on there when you email me we can have a, a potential client relationship it's called where i can answer specific questions for free and uh see if there's something you know long term we can work on together but if not i'm always happy to just give you some basic advice and answer questions for free uh, the more people I work with in Ireland, the more of a tax write-off it is for me to go drink in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Um, I think that's everything. We will welcome you if occasionally you are visiting. So if it lines up with one of our meetups, I'll drag you along. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. And we can ply you with legal questions in person. <laughs> I've been there to one already. It was a it was a great time. No worries. And cool. We'll we'll wrap up there. I think. Um, Ryan, thanks so much for, for your time and helping us with that. That is going to be good. I'll, we'll um, put this up on YouTube in a couple of weeks, probably. I'll, I'll be in touch. You can share it if you want. Let's, yeah, uh, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>